I'm Errol Barnett at the CBS Broadcast Center here in New York. Moments from now, a tribute service for Rosalind Carter will begin at the Glen Memorial Church on the campus of Emory University in Atlanta. This has taken place just over a week after the second longest lived former first lady in the country's history died at the age of 96 in her home state of Georgia. President Biden, Vice President Harris, former President Clinton, and former first ladies Melania Trump, Michelle Obama, Hillary Clinton, and Laura Bush, they are all expected to attend this service. CBS News senior national correspondent Mark Strassman joins us now from Atlanta and also on your screen, you see CBS News chief election and campaign correspondent Robert Costa joining us from Washington. A pleasure to have you both at what's a really somber moment for the country. Mark, I want to start with you. What is the purpose of today's tribute as it's being described and, and how does it differ from that of other scheduled remembrance events for former first ladies? Oh, well, Earl, I think this is the public side of the farewell. This is America's chance to say goodbye to Rosalind Carter. The events tomorrow, the funeral service and the burial are going to be private, uh, essentially just family only. Uh, but today is is really everybody else's chance to either either be here in one way or another. Um, you, uh, the dignitaries, of course, will be here in person. Other folks, who will, millions more perhaps, will be watching uh, watching at home. You know, you have including Mr. Carter himself. Uh, you're going to have three U.S. presidents and uh, all five living first ladies who are here. That's that's a, a pretty star-studded uh, political lineup and a tribute to uh, Rosalind Carter and her life uh, long-lived and, and well-lived. And so uh, whatever happens in the next uh, 90 minutes or so, which is the scheduled length of this service, the Carters themselves have been involved in the meticulous planning of this for the last 20 years. Uh, so whatever you see today is, is their wishes that are going to be as faithfully executed as possible. And uh, we're still waiting, as, as I look inside now at, the, at the, the, the feed coming from inside the church, we're still waiting for the family to show up and, and some of those, uh, some of those uh, VIPs to show up too. But I, I think you're going to see uh, 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 expressions of admiration for Rosalind Carter. Uh, I think you're going to get a sense of her personal side too. Uh, people always talk about her warmth uh, and how she was able to inspire others to uh, to do to do greater things than they, they might have thought possible through her own example. I kept uh, hearing over the last couple of days that nobody worked harder than she did, and she. She just inspired other people to work harder than they, again, than they thought possible. So you're going to see a lot uh, today, and I, and I think one of the highlights is going to be, assuming um, Mr. Carter is is also well enough to be here, 99 frail in hospice for the last 10 months. Uh, that that will be one of the more touching moments too, that he's he's back in a room uh, with his wife and, and able to say his own version of farewell. Yeah, without a doubt. You know, as we. Um look and consider the former first lady's legacy and the backdrop is this just incredible American love story. Former President Carter, after their first date, um, told his mother that she's the girl I want to marry. And he was asked, you know, more recently about their relationship and said it's the best decision he ever made. Uh, Bob, I want to bring you into this because knowing that the former president's expected to attend today's service, even though he's been in hospice care throughout this past year, is significant in and of itself. Talk to us about what we expect to witness. It's significant to see President Carter uh, attending and likely to attend this memorial service, but it's not surprising. It, it only takes one or two trips to Plains, Georgia, where President Carter grew up, and to see his boyhood home, to tour his high school, which has now become a museum, to truly understand the grit of this former president and of this late first lady. There's a home uh, just a few blocks away from where the Carters uh, have lived for the last few decades, where the Carter family first moved when Jimmy Carter left the Navy to come back to Plains to take over the family's peanut business. And this was a time of tension in the Carter marriage. It was a decades-long romance, but it was oftentimes some, a, a relationship that had its bumps in terms of the, the issues they were dealing with, tough political campaigns in a Georgia that was divided on race, uh, adversity when it comes to the family's well-being, the family business. But time and again, when you talk to allies of the family, family members, you read books about the Carters, you understand that going back 
decades, long before he even became governor of Georgia. This was a couple that was working together to change Georgia, to change planes, to ultimately change the United States, to work together for issues uh, in particular like peace, global peace, housing for those in need. And the images of this presidency that only lasted a term really became, in the words of historian Douglas Brinkley, an unfinished presidency. And that un mm. unfinished presidency was a project and a journey not only for Jimmy Carter, but for Rosalind Carter. Yeah, and Bob and Mark, I invite you both to, you know, acknowledge uh, who you recognize as we watch uh, invited guests join this memorial service and have a conversation about uh, what is meant to be a celebration of the life of, of Rosalind Carter. Um, I know that the presidency is difficult on a marriage. I mean, if you listen to what former President Barack Obama, even George W. Bush acknowledged, um, it can, it put, the presidency itself can put a strain on the relationship, but Rosalind Carter was able to uh, advocate for mental health and, and mental health care. Um, Mark, what else do you expect to be noted here as we consider her legacy? Well, just to pick up on what Bob is saying, too, I mean, the partnership of, of uh, the Carters, I mean, they seem to to think and to move and to act uh, two people, but uh, as one. I mean, Jimmy Carter once said that uh, that his wife was a nearly equal extension of himself. And I think you, you're probably going to hear some of that today, too. I mean, their 77-year marriage, I mean, as you said, Errol, a great American love story, but a 77-year partnership not only personally but politically too and and what they were able to accomplish both in in the country and outside the country uh, two people moving as one using their using their prestige and their celebrity as a force for good i mean all of that is going to be i think acknowledged today and and deservedly so i mean the 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 carters are have been hailed for decades now as as the role model of what a post presidency should look like and if, if that's not acknowledged today, it probably ought to be. And we're watching and acknowledging now that both uh, Georgia senators have arrived, Warnock and Ossoff, there as we watch the celebration of the life of Rosalind Carter. Um, we've been discussing by now what was the kind of national impression of not just the Carter presidency, but their, their marathon marriage. Uh, Robert, I know you spent a lot of time in Plains, Georgia throughout throughout your career. Talk to us about more of the local legacy that uh, they both are leaving. So often, former presidents of the United States, they leave the White House and they go on to do a lot of different things, whether it's giving speeches, writing books, being part of different initiatives. And the Carters certainly did that together, uh, working throughout the world on issues like peace, uh, global health, uh, trying to really address poverty in different continents. But what's striking about the Carter legacy as a couple is that while they were working throughout the world, Rosalind Carter and Jimmy Carter kept themselves embedded in the life of this tiny town in southern Georgia, Plains, Georgia. And I've had the opportunity, really the honor, to step into their hometown church and to speak to their pastor. And when you're in this small church, and I've, I've heard Billy Carter's daughter, President Carter's uh, brother's uh, daughter, uh, preach in that church, you get a sense that this is a, a president who won the power in the United States, won the ultimate office in the American political system, but decided to come home with his wife to the simple life. And it's such a unique thing to be able to balance the simplicity of life in Plains with the engagement at a real and deep level with issues abroad and across the country. But Jimmy Carter and Rosalind Carter have always been able to have that balance in their life. And it's been an example to millions of people, not just here but throughout the world, about how you can keep your values even as you rise up the ladder in different aspects of life. And in this day and age, that just seems like a completely different world, uh, that of humility from the people who occupy the highest office in the country. Mark, uh, on the first page of the memorial service program, there's a quote from the former first lady, which reads, do what you can to show you care about others and you will make our world a better place. Uh, we just heard Bob there speak about how Plains, Georgia was the place they returned to and helped them stay humble. But in your point of view, how were the Carters 
able to stay so humble and, and to keep things so local despite their massive profiles? I think faith was a big part of it, their faith. Um, I, I, I think their small town roots was an, were another big part of it. I mean, you have to, you have to actually go to Plains to, to get a sense of just how small it really is, how improbable their journey was uh, just to get to the governor's mansion, never mind uh, rise all the way to the White House. I mean, it's just a few hundred people, 150 miles south of here, very, very rural. There's basically a, a, a commercial block, and that's it, and just a few stores, and most of those stores are pretty much of a tribute to uh, Jimmy Carter souvenirs. Uh, and, 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 and so, uh, let me give you an example. I was at a restaurant yesterday called Manuel's, which is about a block from the Carter Center, and the, the, the owner was telling me that the Carters used to pop in about once a week. They would walk over, have lunch, uh, very, very gracious to uh, to everybody who they came in contact with, who might recognize them. Uh, also, always gracious to the staff. I mean, they were just like a couple of neighbors down the street who would pop in and have lunch. Except, of course, they were the former first, uh, the former president and first lady of the United States. And and without fail, people have always talked about the graciousness of of both Carters and how there was never any pretense to them, never any airs about them. They were just simple people from Plains, Georgia, who happened to lead an extraordinary life. That's fascinating, Mark. A great story there from, from not too far away. We're continuing to watch guests arrive um, at the memorial service for former First Lady Rosalind Carter. We've got Mark Strassman and Bob Costa joining me as we talk about not just the, the legacy of the Carters, but of the former First Lady herself, Bob, in many ways during the single term, she helped reshape what the, the executive role was for a first lady. She sat in on cabinet meetings. Um, she was very visible. Speak to us to, uh, about the ways in which that legacy lives on. The context is, is, is important to recall. It, when President Carter was elected in 1976, he was this total outsider coming to Washington. And he really relied on Rosalind as someone he trusted. He had an inner circle of aides like Hamilton Jordan and Jody Powell, uh, young men in their 20s and 30s who had helped him become governor of Georgia, helped him become president. But he relied on Rosalind for counsel when it came to judgment, sometimes personnel in terms of reading people's character, and in a sense of policy. And, and Carter's famous for not only referencing Rosalind as part of his decision-making process, but famously at a debate talking about his own daughter, Amy, and how he listened to his daughter when it came to thinking through world affairs. And Rosalind Carter followed in the footsteps of Betty Ford, the first lady, the wife of then-president Gerald Ford, uh, who, who served as president from 1974 to early 1977. And she was someone who uh, was more public with her own personal issues, dealing with addiction, she spoke about issues in a, in a forthright way. It wasn't just a social role as First Lady. And so coming into the office of First Lady, Rosalind Carter developed her own portfolio, focusing on mental health, but also being seen as someone who's an equal in terms of thought, in terms of political uh, power, in a sense, not maybe elected power, but presence in a room as the President of the United States. And to see someone like Secretary Clinton there today who famously worked closely with her own husband, President Bill Clinton, in the, in the White House, is indicative of the legacy of Rosalind Carter, who paved a way for her future first ladies to work closely with the president, with their spouses. And on that point, um, also in the program, there's a quote from the former first lady when she testified to Congress on the topic of mental health back in 1979. So consider the time, even though this will sound pretty acceptable today. She said, quote, I want people to know what I know, that today, because of research and our knowledge of the brain, mental illness can be treated and diagnosed differently, and the majority of those with these conditions can recover and leave fulfilling, fulfilling lives. I mean, pretty common to say that today, but back in 1979, Mark, this was remarkable. Um, she did, in a way, go out on a limb to emphasize the importance of mental health. Mental health in the 70s was something that was whispered about. I mean, whispered. I mean, people just didn't talk about it. Uh, and, and what she worked for all her life was to destigmatize what mental health and mental health therapy could, could mean to the lives of everyday Americans. I mean, in many cases, 
her, her drive to push this into an open, honest conversation about, uh, about an issue that troubles millions of Americans uh, was a lifesaver. I mean, it was a lifesaver in that it encouraged people to acknowledge that they had an issue and to get the help that they needed, as opposed to hiding it out of, a, out of shame or out of fear that they were going to be judged in some, in some uh, unjust way. And, and so I, I think all, all of that is very true. I mean, she was, she wasn't only, uh, not only at the, at, the, at the head of that parade, she was, she was the drum major, she was so far ahead of that parade, uh, in, in terms of the way she brought on mental health therapy uh, to the forefront. It was interesting, I was listening to a clip today of her talking at, at Betty Ford's funeral, and she was saying mm. the same thing about Betty Ford and her, her, her battle with breast cancer, which was another issue that in the 70s just wasn't widely talked about. And she talked about how her inspiration uh, for mental health therapy May have come from may have come from Betty Ford and her courage in speaking up about breast cancer, and so you can start to see, you can start to trace the lineage here, mm. right? I mean, Betty Ford to Rosalind Carter, Rosalind Carter to Hillary Clinton as another activist first lady, yeah. and so uh, when these five first ladies gather here today, I think they're all going to say to themselves, you know, Rosalind Carter made my job in the White House a lot easier. And that's a remarkable statement there. Five first ladies, uh, you know, where Mark is standing is where the VIPs are entering. You see the motorcades coming in behind him. We're looking at some of that footage now. We're hearing the gathering music before this actual memorial service begins. Uh, Bob, one of the former first ladies who we expect to see is Melania Trump, somebody that we actually haven't seen in public in many months, if not longer. Perhaps you know better than I would. Um, how significant is it at moments like this for memorial services, for funerals, um, when we look at who does and does not decide to show? I'm, I'm just, I just think it's noteworthy that Melania Trump, the former first lady, will be visible today. It is noteworthy. Uh, Mrs. Trump is well known as a private person. Uh, she has largely shunned the, the limelight since she left the White House in early 2021. That is not to say she's some kind of... Um, Hermit, she is uh, seen occasionally socially uh, by people, especially in New York at Trump Tower or in Mar-a-Lago at the former president's estate down in Palm Beach, Florida. But it, it is something that's important to note that all of these former first ladies are showing up. They're, they're making their presence known out of respect. Now, not every former president is there, uh, but it, it, there's nothing to read into that uh, unless you get some kind of statement from them that there's a reason they're not there. It's, it's usually usually a scheduling issue uh, from what I can tell based on my conversations behind the scenes with allies of some of these former presidents. It's not any kind of statement about Mrs. Carter or President Carter. Uh, President Carter, though, is someone who has hovered over the presidency of so many, the first ladies uh, and presidents who came after him because he was not someone who, while he did go back to planes, he remained so active in global affairs, often taking positions on foreign policy issues at odds with those in the White House. So he is not, President Carter has not always drawn warm responses from every single successor in the presidency. But at, at its core, you have from all of the successors to President Carter, respect for the Carter family, because even if they don't agree with where the Carters stand politically, uh, they respect the, the work the Carters have done on human rights, on, on community service. And they respect that this is an American couple that was in the arena together. Mm. And some may argue their work outside the White House has done more to cement their legacy in the country and around the world than what happened in the White House, which is a remarkable statement in and of itself. Uh, we are watching and listening uh, to the memorial service for former First Lady Rosalind Carter. The gathering music is playing. Uh, dignitaries and guests are entering the Glen Memorial Church there at Emory University in Atlanta. We've got Bob Costa and Mark Strassman um, helping us kind of discuss and digest the legacy of this remarkable woman. We'll continue to watch and uh, highlight guests as they arrive.